Yes. So Betsy, you're on mute. So I don't know if what's happening. Um, so I'm going to assume that that you, you're on mute. So I can't hear you at all, Betsy. I can't hear you at all. So you need to unmute yourself. If you can unmute yourself. That would I'm be still. I'm still okay, now you're yeah, unmuted. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm still getting the hang of uh, these um, hybrid meeting. We have both a live audience and the the Zoom room. Uh, I just made a few comments about the victors who always write the his, the, the history and how later generations have to correct. Them. And if you'll tell us if you're about Menorja, yeah, his fight is, and the um, general situation, and also Holly. I just through. Okay, well, thank you, Betsy. You're kind of cutting in and out, so I think I'm just gonna take right. over. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, because you were real fuzzy in and out, but hello, everybody. I'm here in Portland, Oregon. I'm so happy to join you today. Uh, my name is Chisao Hata, and I am the creative director at the Japanese American Museum of Oregon located in Portland in the former Nihon Machi. We're of the Multnomah, Klaxonai, and Chinook tribal area here in um, Portland, Oregon. And I'm so happy to join you today. Yesterday, um, March 28th, is officially Minori Yasui Day in the state of Oregon. And that is due to many, many years of work that his daughter, Holly Yasui, who some of you had the fortune of knowing, um, worked on not only the state recognizing her father and an American hero in our estimate, uh, who stood up at a time when standing up really wasn't the thing to do. Um, at our museum, we are dedicating the actual cell that he was held in for nine months in solitary confinement. It was located in the Multnomah County Jail where he was held. Uh, and then now it's been moved and it's on permanent display at our museum. And on April 1st, that's this Saturday, um, you can live stream to see not only the small film that we made about the cell dedication, about a poem written for Holly, uh, a lot of poetry that was written by men in the cell will be read by a local actor who has played him, whose name is Heath Hewn. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about how we got the cell in our museum, which opened during COVID. So we're a brand new museum. We've been in what's known as historic old town for about 30 years. Um, but if you come to Portland, we have the Japanese American Historical Society, uh, Garden, Japanese American Historical Plaza, which is located on the Willamette River. And it is uh, dedicated to the history, the 100 year history of Japanese Americans in Oregon. And so you could come to that plaza right now. The cherry trees are in full bloom. They're so beautiful. Um, and then we started the museum after the plaza was built in 1990. And then during this time, we moved into a brand new space. So we've only been here for two years. And Minori Yasui is a big part of our museum because of the work that he did, not only through redress, um, but he'd passed away, sadly, before redress, before the bill was passed in 1988. Uh, and his daughter, Holly, also sadly passed due to COVID-19 two years ago. Uh, so we want to lift up her work and all the years of work that she did with and for her father, which led up to also him being the only Oregonian to have received a Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Barack Obama in 2015. And so Minori Yasui, as a young attorney, 25 years old, 
when the curfew order was uh, initiated, it was part of what was the executive order 9066. And that was the order that the militaries had enforced to remove 125,284 Japanese and Japanese Americans off the West Coast of America. Why? The military leaders said due to um, military necessity. This happened after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And remember that Japanese Americans had been in Oregon since the late 1800s. So there had been a long history of racism that Japanese and Chinese had faced on the West Coast, not only in Oregon, but all along the West Coast in California um, and Washington and Oregon. But when the war broke out and the Executive Order 9066 was issued, it led to the incarceration of Japanese and Japanese Americans. About 4,000 people from what we call Japantown or Nihon Machi were moved into now known as the Expo Center, then the Portland Assembly Center. It was a livestock exposition hall. So they moved the animals out. They built the stalls on top of the animal stalls and moved the people in. And this is where we were, went for the first five months while mostly people from Portland went to Minidoka in Minidoka, Idaho. So one of the 10 primary concentration camps in America. Along with the order of having to leave all of their family, uh, all of their uh, family farms, everything, the life they had built. And remember the average age was in their mid fifties. And so they had, you know, really established a life in Oregon and then overnight pretty much lost it all. Um, there was also a curfew order that said, if you are 116th Japanese or Japanese American, you must be off the streets of Portland by 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. And because Minori Asui, as a young attorney, said this was just not correct. And he asked people, will you fight this? Will you stand up against this law that's unjust, unjust? And no one could really take that stand. So as a 25-year-old, he decided to do so. So on March 28th, it's when he walked the streets of Portland and uh, he was not arrested. So he walked to the police station and he said, you must arrest me. I am violating the curfew order of Executive Order 9066. He was told, just go home, just go home. And he said, no, I'm violating this order uh, and you must arrest me. So they did. And they sent him into nine months of solitary confinement. His case, along with two other cases, Gordon Hirabayashi from Seattle and Fred Korematsu from California, all three of those cases went to the Supreme Court during 1942 and 43. Their cases were upheld by the Supreme Court and said that it was due to military necessity. Well, what happened years later, after the redress movement began in 1980, the Freedom of Information Act released documents that proved and were suppressed from the Supreme Court at that time that there was no indication of any Japanese or Japanese American uh, being accused of sabotage or spies or this is this is the justification that they were using to call it military necessity. They were protecting the West Coast. But in actuality, it was a move that was economic um, to take the land away from people who had built it up uh, and to uh, really move forward in what had been a racist history towards Asians and Asian Americans. And um, so Minori Yasui led that fight, as did Korematsu and Hirabayashi. And after the Freedom of Information Act, we could then go back and say, this was wrong. We now have information to prove that their, uh, their cases were wrongly met. And so Korematsu's was overturned. Uh, Hirabayashi's was. However, Yasui passed during 
the work that was being done to overturn his case. All three of those cases were combined to be known as the writ of Coram Nobis, and it was led by a team of young Sanse attorneys, third generation Sanse, uh, and they are still working today. They're working on immigration. They, they didn't know that they'd be working 50 years later, but they still are um, fighting for justice, fighting for equality, uh, fighting against racism in America. And so the writ of Quorum Nobis was a very important turnover case that these young attorneys actually won and made happen. And so Minori Yasui is an American hero. He is an American hero that not very many people know about. And we want to lift up his name. We want to lift up his work. We want to lift up the work of Holly Yasui and the work she did, not only in Mexico, but in the United States for global justice, for justice of, of immigrants and other people who are suffering in America. And I'm so happy that you are today showing her film, Never Give Up. Uh, and I have to say that I was a part of many projects working with Holly and Never Give Up was one of them. Um, we had readings of her play uh, called Unvanquished that then turned to Citizen Men. So Holly was a, a writer, an extremely good writer, an intellectual, an organizer, and really a protector of the legacy of her father. And so with that, she established, along with Peggy Nagai, one of those young attorneys, the Min Yasui Legacy Project. And I put that in the chat. You can see that online. You can see the work that we're doing. You can register for the virtual program that's happening this Saturday. You can see the film that we made about the cell and the cell dedication. And so I just want to invite all of you to come. Um, I also want to note that um, I'm so happy to have this connection with the Global Justice Center. Uh, I'm also Sad to hear about the recent loss of one of your leaders, Clifford Durand, and that Holly was uh, friends with Clifford, I understand. We didn't know much about her life in, in Mexico because when she came here, she was so busy doing all the justice work for her father and for other communities. So I hope you enjoy the film. I hope you will come to Portland one day and visit the Japanese American Museum of Oregon. You can see us at jamo.org and um, please go on those websites and learn more. And I'm so happy and thankful to Betsy for making this all happen and glad to join you today. I can't hear a word you're saying, Betsy, but... <laughs> I think you're still on mute, so. Yeah, I did. I did a lot of work here in San Miguel and in uh, Dolores Hidalgo with CEDESA, the Centro para el Desarrollo Social y Agropecuaria. And she was very dedicated to the the campesino and helping them in their struggle for a better life. Um, the poem that was written for Holly is in the chat box, so you can download it and read it. And then you can also see the information that um, she said in the chat uh, as well. So now we'll turn to our video. Never give up. And thank you so much, Chisau. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for Have your a wonderful day. Thank you. Uh -huh. Bye. Thank you. We are concerned with the very fundamental constitution government of the United States 
can indeed make distinction between citizens on the basis of ancestry or national origin. His whole life was that entire spectrum of leadership, from a lawyer to a community activist and a patriot, his entire life. This is my country. I come from the Hood River Valley, and so I was nurtured by the sawing that kind of a feeling. I want to make this our country the best in the world. Minoru Yasui, known as Min, was born in 1916 in the far... His parents, Masuo and Shizuyo, were first-generation Japanese immigrants known as Issei. Their children, the second generation, were known as Nisei. Min was a third son in a large but close... They were considered aliens ineligible for citizenship because at that time, U.S. law permitted only so-called free white persons to become naturalized citizens. But the Nisei born in the U.S. were sixth amendment of the U.S. Constitution. The Yasui family, Issei parents and Nisei children, settled in the valley nestled between the Columbia River and Mount Hood and pursued their American dream rural community. Back in the early days, there were probably 75 to 100 Japanese American families here. Father and my uncle ran a um, dry goods store called the Yasui Brothers. They sold curios and provisions. As a result, um, he was able to negotiate many kinds of contracts and deals with the landowners in this area. He began to develop interest in farm uh, operations in the Hood River Valley. Masuo was a successful orchardist and farm, rotary club, and Methodist church. Because his English was fluent, he was considered the spokesman for the Japanese and leader of the community. But in the 1920, anti-Asian sentiment was strong in Oregon. These feelings were inflamed by the influence of the Ku Klux Klan, which made major inroads in the state at that time. And in Hood River, there was organized farmland. Despite these hostile undercurrents, the Yasui family, like many immigrants, held fast to their belief in America as a land of opportunity. Dad was very adamant about it, is that because you are a part of the soil, because you are a part of America, he insisted the community and indeed our family really sink their roots deep and become American grew up not only pledging allegiance to the flag, but also enjoying typical outdoor activities such as hiking, fishing, and hunting. All the sons participated in the Hood River Boy Scouts, the home who loved the outdoors. He used to take my next oldest brother, Roku, Shu, and me out on trips, and one of the Nice thing he'd do, he'd take us down the Hood River and take us exploring. So he'd go out on the, you know, try to catch. Only two sisters among six brothers in the Yasui family. The two girls, Michi and Yuka, were close. Min had a special bond with his youngest sister, Yuka. He loved Yuka because, you know, Yuka's the big pumpkins and, you know, things like that. I was so lucky to have a big brother who doted on me. 
We lived downtown and across the street, there was a big bank of nothing but wild flowers. And, and, and he would point out that this is, this is spring beauty. This is a, a buttercup. This is a bluebell. So when springtime comes, I think of, I think of men and I think the gift. In 1931, at the age of 15, Min helped to found the Mid-Columbia Chapter of the Japanese American Citizens League, or JACL, a patriotic civic organization for Nisei, a from Hood River High School. Min enrolled at the University of Oregon and continued to excel academically. He pledged a National Honorary Scholastic Fraternity in order. Meanwhile, in Hood River, the Yasui store and orchards prospered, and the family moved to a large house where they had plenty of room to host the older son's college friends for weekends and holidays. Men continued to work with the Japanese American Citizens League in its mission to foster good citizenship and civic participation. He attended the biennial national conventions in San Francisco and Seattle as a chapter, solidifying what was to become a lifelong commitment to the JACL. He made friends easily and enjoyed horsing around with his pals at college, including fellow cadets in the Reserve Officers Training Corps, a U.S. citizen very seriously, continuing ROTC for an extra year in order to earn a commission as second lieutenant. He graduated from the University of Oregon in 1937 and from the School of Law in 19... However, in spite of his high qualifications, he was unable to get a job in Oregon as an attorney, so he accepted the position as attaché to the Japanese consul in Chicago. The Hood River had their own spacious community hall. This photograph with Masuo and Shizuyo in the center reflects the American dreams and aspirations of a thriving community. But for Japanese Americans everywhere, their world was shattered on December 7, 1941. A date which will live in infamy. United States of America by the Empire of Japan. Min immediately quit his job in Chicago and headed home to Oregon, intending to report for duty with his reserve army unit. The older Yasui children were working or awaited. Homer and Yuka remained at home with their parents. Pretty soon we heard that they were rounding up Japanese school teachers, Japanese ministers, anybody who had leadership roles in their communities. We knew dad. On December 12th, Masuo was arrested by the FBI. We had no idea where dad was. We didn't know whether he had been shot, whether he was in prison, whether he had been deported. When men got back to Vancouver, some ranking officer told me that I would not be accepted immediately at that time, but they would uh, let me know. Well, frankly, they never did let me know, so I never did uh, join the United States Army. Terrible back with the expectation of serving my country. In the wake of Pearl Harbor, anti-Japanese sentiment, which had been simmering on the West Coast for decades, exploded into vindictive hate. I wasn't safe for me to be walking down the street because someone would take a shot at me. The feeling was very intense. It certainly was very much opposed to the presence of Japanese Americans in this area. I went into this store and this store 
get out of here. And I said, no, I, I just want to buy some bread. He said, you can't read? And on the storefront it says, no goddamn Japs or dirty dogs allowed in this store. It's some bread. He says, listen, goddamn kid, you're a Jap. Go home and eat rice. Nearly 75 years later, Oregon State Representative Brian Clem introducing day described the temper of the times. And there's a newspaper article. This came from the Hood River paper at the time. And it says, these are the lists of all the Japanese farmers and their names and their acreages. Next week, so old since Pearl Harbor. Our ultimate aim will be to get a check in front of each and every name. So they wanted to get all their land. Which eventually they did, buying up hundreds of acres of land developed by Japanese farmers as the federal government Japanese problem on the West Coast. Men moved to Portland, the largest city in Oregon, in order to open a law practice and to have better access to government offices. His legal services were in great and with frozen bank accounts, revocation of licenses, and other complications caused by new and changing government regulations. Then, ten weeks after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the President of the United States issued Executive Order 9066, which provided that the Secretary of War and all subordinate commanders would have the authority to declare certain war zones and to prescribe certain. General John DeWitt, head of the Western Defense Command, declared an area approximately 100 miles inland from the coast as Military Area 1. They included half the states of Washington, Oregon, And within these particular restricted areas, the military commander issued a curfew order and travel restriction applied against all enemy aliens of It seemed to me that a military order distinguishing between one citizen on one hand and another citizen on the basis of mental action that he could violate to challenge the constitutionality of Executive Order 9066 because the curfew said all persons of Japanese ancestry. That was the first take an action against, and he did that. We look for a test case because certainly under the Constitution, under the laws, we have the right to appeal any order that we think is not proper. We want to find the United States Army, have a cute wife, you know, a couple of very endearing children make a wonderful test case, but unfortunately. I've asked groups of lawyers, would you be willing to do this? Would you put your professional on the line to test the constitutionality um, of an order? And uh, in, a, in one room of 70 lawyers, these were government lawyers, one person raised his hand. So these are people representing the government. So for, for Yasui to do that against all odds is incredible. Um, it's just extraordinary. But this is the United States of America, founded in liberty, dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. And this was happening in our country. As an award, I felt that we owed at least the obligation as a citizen to tell our government they are wrong. That is the sacred duty of every citizen. 
So men set out to purposely violate Proclamation Number no. 3, the curfew imposed on all persons of Japanese ancestry, on March 28th at 8 p.m. I walked for over three hours, and I got tired of walking up and down Third Avenue, so I did approach a police officer. And being a smart aleck and being an attorney, I pulled out the proclamation pointing out that I was in that I was a person of Japanese ancestry, asked the officer to arrest me, and the officer said, look, uh, you'll get in trouble, go on and run along home. And that certainly didn't serve my purposes, so I went down to the Second Avenue police station and talked to the sergeant. And he threw me into the drunk tank. That's how the case began at 11.20 p.m., 28th day of March, 1942. When news got out that Min had been arrested and her mental health and her distress, and I say, you know, Min called and he says, you know, Mom says, your dad is gone. You don't, we don't even know where dad is. And now I'm in prison. And he apologized to mom for giving her more grief, more to worry about. I knew mother was home, saying, uh, your mother, you, you must be worried. Mother says, translated, it means um, worry nonsense. I encourage you, I stimulate and spur you on. After spending the weekend in the drunk tank, Min was released on bail the following Monday. A week later, the National Secretary of the JACL, Mike Masaoka, issued an official statement about Min Yasu is unalterably opposed to test cases to determine the constitutionality of military regulations. Self-styled martyrs capture the headlines but we have pledged our wholehearted cooperation by the organization he had helped to found. Men pressed on. He wrote to General John L. DeWitt, who issued the curfew and travel restrictions, declaring that the president of our United repeated that we are fighting a war to preserve the four freedoms throughout the world. Surely, then, it is of paramount importance to preserve those self-same freedoms within the United States of America. DeWitt did not answer Min's letter, but he was known to have said, A Jap's a Jap, no matter if he's a U.S. citizen or not. The racial strains are undiluted. And he proceeded with the roundup of all persons of... During the months of March, April, and May, the military then began to issue orders indicating that any person of Japanese ancestry would have to report to what then called from the West Coast. They were allowed to take only what they could carry. Families had to sell, store, or abandon their possessions, including houses, furniture, farms, pets. Men worked 16-hour days trying to help people to prepare for eviction from their homes and communities within less than a month. The Yasui Brothers store had to quickly liquidate their stock, but they could not sell all of it before the family had to leave Hood River. Min's sister, Michi, was a seed. She asked for permission to stay in Eugene for her graduation in June, 
but her request was denied. When the general evacuation orders began to be issued, at the military action, In May, the area, including men, were imprisoned in the Livestock Exposition Building, which had been converted into a so-called assembly center. For the military taken over the North Portland Livestock Pavilion, it was a livestock farm. And obviously it was intended to exhibit livestock. Cattle, horses, pigs, chickens, and all the rest. And as you approached it, you were led into this enclosure, surrounded again by barbed wire. And on each corner, you had the watchtowers. And not in the watchtowers, there were searchlights, so no one could possibly escape at night. As men was being herded into the Portland Livestock River, including Shizio, Homer, and Yuka, were ordered to board a train. We had a cat named Nicodemus and a dog named Mike. And, you know, I was very concerned that they were not going to be evacuated. What are you going to do with them? You can't explain to them why you're leaving them. It was kind of sad and lonely to get down. The sad part was we had no idea where we were going. Was it going to be hot or cold? Do you take an overcoat? Are you going to come back? Despite the orders by the military guards to keep the blinds out, the Yasui family knew they would be going through Eugene. We were heading south, and Michi, my sister, was at the University of Oregon, and she caught wind that this train might be going by. So if you lift up the blinds, they knew you were a traitor right there. You know, you're going to spy, see what's out there. But anyway, we raised it, and we could see Michi in Eugene, and she was waiting. She didn't know what she was waiting at. And so my mother... Mother said, because we thought, will we ever see Michi again? The next day, Michi defied the same proclamation that men challenged. She violated the travel risk before she was scheduled to be removed. She took a bus to Denver, Colorado, outside the exclusion area, in order to establish a home in the free zone so that her family could relocate there. Continued south in the shuttered train. We finally got to our destination and it was uh, uh, Pinedale, which is right near Fresno, and hot as Hades. But when we got the you know, the elder people, particularly the women, fainting from the heat because it was hot and there was no shade. We were standing out in the sun and being processed and signed. Pinedale, like the Portland Livestock Pavilion, was one of 15 temporary detention centers retrofitted by the military. In California, there were 12 of these incarceration facilities and one each in Washington, Oregon, and Arizona. In total, over 120,000 persons registered by the government, rounded up, tagged, and corralled into these centers, surrounded by barbed wire, watchtowers, and military guards. They were called assembly centers because people were being brought in temporary 
from a period of about April, May, June, they forced people into horse barns, racetracks, uh, fairgrounds, temporary shelters built out in farmland. And the facilities were at these detention centers especially those previously used to house animals, were degrading. They put up partitions of plywood, and then they shoved in over 3,000 people in those places. And this is right at the beginning. Song about flies and stink. But the Japanese Americans made the best of their terrible circumstances, smiling for the camera, and doing what they could to improve their makeshift living quarters. Until... During September, they started the movement out of the assembly centers into the 10 more prominent camps in the interior of the United States. There were two in California, Tule Lake, uh, one at Manzanarm, two in Arizona, in Adoka, Heart Mountain in Wyoming, Topaz in the state of Utah, Granada. Then there were two in Arkansas on the river bottoms of the Arkansas River. They were Jerome and Roar. The entire population of Japanese Americans on the West Coast, children and elders, were branded as enemy aliens, potential spies, and imprisoned for no other reason than their ancestry. Not a single Japanese American was or compromising the national security of the United States. Men and the other prisoners in the Portland Detention Center were packed off to the Minidoka concentration camp. Two trains, they, they threw all the blinds, they loaded the families in, they you know, all had ID numbers. My number was 16263. They didn't tattoo it on me, but one, six, two, six, three. Men recalled their arrival in the fall of 1942 during a speech at a post-war pilgrimage to the Minidoka concentration camp. It's been almost 50 years, a half a century, and those of remember, 42 years and 10 months ago, Coming off that railroad siding down the road here a bit. Remember the luggage being piled on the siding? Your mother's, your father's luggage. Watching the trucks come over the hill, kicking up clouds of dust. Going up what was then a dirt road. Coming across those flats with the lava outcroppings. Seeing here on this slight rise. I know people got off the train and cried. The Minidoka concentration camp was still under construction. The barracks were not completed. The mess halls were not, the restrooms, the bathhouses were not complete. In August and September, it was hot. And remember the dust that blew. The dust that got into everything. As you tear up the desert, the soil pulverizes and even everywhere. And then as the winter came on, the rains came, it became chill and the mud, the ever-present mud. And you could always spot the outhouses because as people walk through the mud, their overshoes are going up to the outhouses. And all Surrounding those camps were barbed wire fences guarded by the military police with all of the necessary paraphernalia for war. Rifles, bayonets, machine guns. Shizuyo, Homer, and Yuka were taken from Pinedale to the concentration camp at Tudy Lake, California. We couldn't go outside of the fence but every morning, Mom and I would walk around the trees in these guard houses. There's a Methodist hymn that says, This is my father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget 
that hate may be strong, but love is stronger. And she would say no. In November, I got orders to report for trial, so they sent a um, United States Marshal came up to Minidoka, and they put handcuffs on me, and they brought me to Portland. On November 16th, I was found guilty in the U.S. District Court of Oregon and sentenced to one year in jail and a $5,000 fine. He remained in solitary confinement in this cell in the Multnomah County Jail, U.S. Supreme Court. I am in that solitary confinement for nine months, 207 days and 270 nights. You couldn't see the stars at night from the sky during the day. No, they wouldn't, um, Give me a haircut, they wouldn't let me cut my nails. My nails are long like that. Whiskers way down, no razor. Finally, about the fourth month, they gave me a razor and allowed me to take a bath once a week. Men hundreds of letters during his nine months of solitary confinement. Yuka kept everything he wrote to her. Yep, Christmas Day in jail too. It's the first Christmas I have ever spent in jail. I guess it senses, just like a herd of cattle. Writing was Min's connection to the outside world. I asked for a typewriter and it says, no, we can't give you a typewriter because Japs are so clever you might make a weapon. Not me anything. So he hand wrote everything including articles he sent to his ex-secretary, who was imprisoned in Minidoka. She typed them up for publication in camp newsletters, such as The Irrigator. In Minidoka formed the Civil Liberties League and passed out flyers to support men's legal defense. However, the National Secretary of JACL, Mike Masaoka, responded by visiting Minidoka and just basically standing alone. During the time I was um, in jail, in solitary, I did do a lot of thinking. I guess the thing really is that I knew I was right, you know, and I was... Determination and refusal to yield to bitterness seemed to have influenced the national JACL. Two months after Masaoka broke up Min's support group in Minidoka, JACL reversed its policy and announced it would leave on behalf of Yasui's test case before the Supreme Court. And I always figured the United States Supreme Court is going to sustain us, so I guess there was a, a feeling that um, surely this country is going to do the right thing. You know On June 21st, Snyden's appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court was handed down. What the Supreme Court said was that because of military necessity, that the government had a compelling interest to do what they did. So Min lost his appeal before the U.S. Supreme Court. He did not lose his faith in the U.S. Constitution. I do not believe that the Constitution failed. I think some of our institutions composed of men did indeed fail us. His nine-month ordeal in solitary confinement was over. I was released from Multnomah County Jail in August of 1943, and there I shipped back to Minidoka again in irons. At the Tule Lake concentration camp, Shizuo had sent Homer to Denver on a student leave to stay with Michi. She wanted to keep Yuka, her youngest, by her side, but she was concerned. Mom would say, 
you can't stay in camp here. You are not getting an education. You better leave. I'm 15 years old. My mother would be left alone in camp, and she's telling me, get out of here. Get an education. Yuka safely arrived and enrolled at South Denver High School, while Shizuyo continued to wait for permission to leave Tule Lake. Men's return to was low key. During his absence, the army had changed its policy regarding Nisei. In 1943, the army decided that those individuals who could pass a loyalty test uh, could volunteer for the United States. Administered to all Japanese American adults in the camps. But question number 27 asked, would you be willing to serve the United States Army Armed Forces on combat duty wherever sent? Now, the, the military, but bureaucracy being bureaucracy, somehow the WRA applied that to everyone. And that's stupid because here a grandpa 70 years old or grandma 60 years old is getting a question saying, are you willing to serve on armed combat? But question number 28, qualified allegiance to the United States of America, and every American citizen perfectly willing to say yes. But it went on further, and forswear allegiance to the Emperor of Japan. I asked myself, holy smokes, I never owed any allegiance to the Emperor of Japan. I never owed admitting that I did owe it. If I say no, then I'm saying I won't be loyal to the United States. You're in a catch-22 situation. So. Many people qualified their answers, but the administration wanted a yes, yes, or a no, no. Those who answered, which was designated as a high security segregation camp for so-called disloyals to be sent to Japan. Applications for leave by so-called loyals at two lake room for the influx of dissidents from the other camps who answered no no and Shizuyo was finally released to join Yuka and Michi in Denver Homer had moved on to Pennsylvania to join Masuo who had been shuffled through a series of Justice Department facilities ended up in the camp in Santa Fe New Mexico In March of 19 recruiting for the newly created All Nisei 442nd Regimental Combat Team, men tried once more to enlist, but he was rejected again because he now had a criminal record. They went to the camps and the volunteers. They went to Hawaii. They wanted 1,500 volunteers and 10,000 volunteers. The military also recruited intelligence officers. 6,000 men of Japanese ancestry performed the interrogation. They were intercepting radio messages. They went into the caves of Saipan and talked the Japanese soldiers into surrendering General Willoughby, who was the aide-de-camp for General MacArthur, said that by at least two years and unquestionably saved at least a million American soldier lives. The work of the military intelligence service was classified. There was no publicity about the Nisei soldiers in the Pacific. However, the 42nd in Europe were publicly recognized by the army. They fought in Europe, of course, and they covered themselves with glory. They have the most outstanding record of any military unit in the United States Armed Forces. They brought home 9,468 Purple Hearts. The battalion strength is 3,000. The casualty rate was 300%. In 1944, the U.S. government reinstated the draft, mandatory military service for Nisei incarcerated in the camps. In eight of the camps,
two years and unquestionably saved at least a million American soldier lives. The work of the military intelligence service was classified. There was no publicity. However, the extraordinary deeds of valor of the 442nd in Europe were publicly recognized by the army. They fought in Europe, of course, and they covered themselves with glory. They have the most outstanding record of any military. They brought home over 20,000 decorations for battle. They brought home 9,468 Purple Hearts. The battalion strength is 3,000. The casualty rate was 3. In 1944, the U.S. government reinstated the draft, mandatory military service for Nisei incarcerated in the camps. In eight of the camps, there were young draft as a protest against the government unjustly incarcerating them and their families. They were arrested on federal charges of draft evasion. Min was granted temporary leave from Minidoka to visit for the 442nd and to dissuade the draft resistors. We felt that it was important to make the rounds of the camp to insist that it put the protesters in a far better position to say we have fulfilled our obligations. The strongest draft resistance movement was at the Heart Mountain concentration camp in Wyoming. A group called the Fair Play Committee was formed by over 80 men who declared that they were willing to fight for their country, but not restored. I can still remember at the Federal Correctional Institute, an 18-year-old kid. This kid would grip the bars and tears would be coming down his eyes and he says, Look, my father's in a camp someplace in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. We have a 14-year-old sister. Who's going to take care of them if I go off to war? The draft resistors had a strong moral argument. But as an attorney, men felt that they could not win their case since the draft was regardless of race. He counseled the resistors. Don't violate the conscription requirements because you're going to put a criminal record on your life, and, and certainly it's not going to help your mother and sister. ...with the prosecuting attorneys and wrote to the FBI asking for leniency for the draft resistors, given the circumstances in which they and their families were living. But to no avail, the draft resistors were convicted at federal penitentiaries. After Min's unsuccessful attempt to counsel the draft resistors, he returned again to Minidoka, where a number of families were still imprisoned. He applied to provide free legal services for those who remained in camp. In June of 1944, his application was approved. He gave me a one-way ticket to Chicago, Illinois, and a check for $25. After a brief stint in Chicago, Min joined his family in Denver, where he enrolled in a course on Colorado law. I took the bar examination in 1945 in June. The Supreme Court says I was number one on the list, but they wouldn't admit me because I had been convicted of a crime and they said I'm a person of bad moral character. He appealed this decision with the help of the ACLU and was licensed to practice law in... And it was only after I passed the bar I decided, well, I'll ask your mother to marry me because... Then you at least... Yeah, I have something to do all this. Before that time, I was just a bum. I was the ex-convict. <laughs> Men married... True one-man law firm. He hired Jun Aochi, fresh out of high school, as his secretary. Men, he would work in the back room and I would be in the front room. 
and I would see the people coming in and out to see him. For legal at that time, the president of the uh, Mountain Plains JCL. He was in his office working night and day, not charging anybody. <laughs> you know, so I, his generosity really impressed me because he was doing everything, not only for the Japanese Americans, but also for Latinos, the youth, the seniors. We always talked about trying to get citizenship for our parents. Masuo Yasui, who was released from the Santa Fe camp in 19th to Hood River. He and Shizuyo moved to Portland, Oregon. For the JACL, naturalization rights for the Issei became a top priority at their first post-war national convention. He traveled to Wyoming, to Texas, he traveled to New Mexico. Wherever there was any Japanese people in the community, he would go there and talk to them about supporting the net. In 1952, Congress passed legislation enabling Asian immigrants to become U.S. citizens. Since Masuo was well-read in the U.S. system of government and history, he initiated and taught Americanization's the citizenship exam. He and Shizuyo were among the first Issei to become naturalized U.S. citizens. In Denver, and with other activists of all races and creeds, he helped to found and develop numerous community organizations dedicated to social justice. In 1951, the city council did enact an ordinance, created a beautiful ordinance that says, go forth and do good. Well, I joined the commission as a member. Thereafter, I was elected chair, and in 1967, was appointed the executive director. The name of the commission was changed to Community Relations, a diverse staff. The one thing I loved about him is that Mr. Yasui was um, very committed to equality for all people not just for Japanese people, but for black people, all of us, to reach for the top. My grandmother was Betty Salazar, and when I first asked her how she got involved in um, civil rights advocacy, she told me, I started at the Human Rights Commission, and Nori Yasui was the one who... She was hired as a secretary, but men noticed her commitment to the commission's goals and to her community. He said, Betty, I think you've uh, shown that you could, you know, work. She was a, a young Latina. She didn't have a college degree. There weren't a lot of people hiring somebody like her for a high profile position where she'd be able to advocate on behalf of her community. Mom um, worked for him. And sometimes that would require my mom to go back to the office to get materials on evenings and Saturdays. And Mr. Yasui was always in the office. I, at times I thought he, he lived there. <laughs> He's always working, always working. The council created the Minoru Yasui Community Volunteer Award. Whereas Mr. Yasui has served the community with honor, dignity, and dedication for over 30 years as an outstanding leader in youth organizations, and whereas he has worked unceasingly and in countless ways for the betterment of the community, be it resolved that the mayor and city council of Denver hereby record their admiration and by officially naming the Minoru Yasui Community Volunteer Award. He really modeled everything that the Minoru Yasui Community Volunteer Award stands for. I'm grateful that part of the continuing the struggle. He demonstrated that this is a lengthy process. Um, it's not for the faint of heart. 
you definitely have to be able to persevere. He really had the courage to persevere and stay the court. Activism from the courtroom to the boardroom to the city council to the community of Denver. In the 1970s, JACL began to discuss strategies for a redress campaign, seeking an official government for the injustices suffered by Japanese Americans during World War II. Not because it affected 120,000 Japanese Americans, but it affects all Americans. Men is probably recognized best for traveling around the country giving speeches. We are concerned with the very fundamental constitutional issue of whether or not the government of the United States can indeed make distinction between citizens on the basis of... Min was chair of the National JACL Redress Committee, and in 1981, he testified in Washington, D.C., before the Federal Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians. I can remember 29 days I came out of the county jail in Portland, Oregon with handcuffs on my wrists, with leg shackles on my ankles. There is no amount of money that can ever repay us for the kinds who give me back nine months of solitary confinement. Who can put a price tag upon that kind of Min was a man on a mission. He wrote thousands of letters and reports, attended thousands of meetings, gave throughout the country. He knew time was running out for the Issei, and his own health was failing. But he wouldn't let up. In 1983, Min and his attorney, Peggy Nagai, reopened on evidence that had been suppressed and altered by the government during the war. This was not only a legal case, it was an educational case, because in times of war, people need to be even more vigilant for protection and not give sway to the fear or to the government saying it's military necessity or it's national security. Min's case was heard before the district court. His wartime conviction dismissed on government documents that proved that General DeWitt's policies were based not on military necessity, but on racial bias. Because of the ties of race, it was impossible to establish the identity and exact separation of sheep from the goats was unfeasible. Peggy and Min appealed to the circuit court for a hearing to establish a legal precedent against racial discrimination by the government under the... I shall always remember. He said to me, I don't know if we're gonna win, but we're gonna give him hell. And that to me is his legacy. The quality of our struggle makes us humane and brings out the best in people. I'll not let this wrong happen again. He stood for that. He continues to stand for that. In the midst of his work on redress and while his legal case was on appeal, Minyeth, 1986, he was buried in his beloved hometown of Hood River, Oregon. Two years later, Congress passed and President Ronald Reagan signed. We saw the president signing that bill and my greatest regret said, this shouldn't be me, it should be men. That was a very poignant. He had fought all his life for civil rights, for due process, for redress. He never gave up. 29 years.
years after headed the effort to win a Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor in the nation for Min Yasui. In 2015, President Barack Obama did award a posthumous Men never stopped fighting for equality and justice for all. Today, men's legacy has never been more important. It is a call to our national conscience, a reminder of our enduring honor of the free and the home of the brave. From the standpoint of history, I think I'd like to have the American people realize that when you subjugate when you suppress or oppress any group of people, getting the rights of all people. Because if you can do it to the least of us, then you can indeed do it to all of us. I should be just as eager to defend your rights as I am my own, because your rights impinges upon mine. If they take, I will fight to preserve yours. If there is suffering or pain that is unfairly imposed upon anyone. It's my duty, it's your duty to try to alleviate it because that's the way in which we gain a better life for all of us. Uh, that's very moving and very relevant to today okay, as well, when we think of justices that are happening to people um, around the world and especially at our borders. Thank you for coming today. Um, would you like to, I don't know this case very, very well, but if you have questions or would like to discuss the film, we can do that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, it's, it, it's been recorded. So you can go to our webpage, globaljusticecenter.org, and you can and watch it on your, on your computer. You knew Holly? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was hoping she might be here. Oh, she passed away from COVID in 21. Yeah. She was so dedicated to the Mexican campesinos. Yeah, that she didn't want to get a vaccine for herself. She's Center for Global Justice. And she went home to Denver to get a vaccine. So she wouldn't take one away from a Mexican campesino. And she caught COVID from her nieces and nephews. And she died at the hospital. Oh, this is in the, in the yeah, winter all, of 21. Yeah. Um, let me.
Global Justice Center, all one word, dot org. And she was very dedicated to all the campesinos and work in the last years of her life, and as well as here in San Miguel. Center dot org. She worked as a volunteer for two years, uh, which is a um, well, maybe you could say a, a little bit. Of that. Well, Sedessa is uh, an organization that is more than fifty years old. And, um, it came out of the liberation theology movement. And they've been teaching local campesinos uh, how to live off the land and how to do so in an ecologically sound way, how to use dry toilet and vegetation, and how to build cisterns to collect rainwater because the the rain the the um, the water in the aquifer in this whole region is contaminated. With um, um, in fact, uh, we our organization has helped with the, mostly with the Rotary Club to build a thousand cisterns for rainwater captation out in the countryside because they're so terribly affected by their well water, which is all contaminated with arsenic. Yeah, but the rainwater is okay. So far, yeah. and uh, uh, so that's one of the things I've been working on for years now. And she was working with Sedessa on the spot so, um, as a volunteer. Yes, she there for a long time. Yeah, it was more than just two years. Oh, I know. On one of the Serratas de Animas. Yeah, we live on the Privada de Animas. Oh. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. Of course. <laughs> oh, if I know of any apartments, no. No, I'm sorry. But I'm sorry to have to give you the, the news of Holly's death. And whoever bought it, yeah. Over the rest of it. Well, thank you. I will make sure to watch the film. So watch watch the film online. Oh, I do So there's more information online, and uh, Chi Sao has put uh, in the chat box information of the Minority Legacy Project, and um, the best way to uh, honor him and to honor Cliff Duran, who just passed away two weeks ago, is to get involved. and do something to, to help the immigrant community, to help whatever, just do something to help anything, whatever, whatever it is. So thank you very much for coming today. Thank you. And uh, today is the 29th of uh, 30th of March. We usually end our snowbird symposium and our in-person presentations at the end of March even though there are still some Canadians who are around. Uh, we are going to end our albums our, uh, on Thursdays, but we have several more Monday programs. And next Monday, um, we will, uh, we're very happy to uh, uh, present the work of uh, Professor Jones just written a book on the trillion dollar silencer. And why is there no peace movement, my God, after 
you know, even the Senate yesterday voted to uh, withdraw the um, authorization of, what was it called? The authorization for, for the use of, of uh, legal, uh, for the use of military force. Yeah, the UAMF in 91 and Iraq. Iraq in 2000. The U.S. has been in so many undeclared wars, it's hard to keep them all straight. Um, and the U.S. Senate wants to take back its right to declare war and not uh, leave it as a prerogative of the um, yeah, executive. Um, so she's going to be talking about the trillion dollar silencer and how Defense Department money has seeped into NGOs, think tanks, uh, not to mention the arms matters of money. Uh, so she'll be speaking on Monday uh, on the, uh, let me look at my calendar here, whatever day of the month that is. Third, third. Uh, and then on the 10th, uh, the bunch of people have just returned from one of our trips to Cuba. We organize trips to Cuba frequently, several times a year. And a group has just be here to present, uh, you know, information about what, what they learned this time in Cuba. So that will be on the 10th. And... Um, I'm not quite sure how to continue um, after that, if we're going to continue with in-person hybrid events or just, just Zoom events, but we'll let you know. So we'll look forward to seeing you here or, or online. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You'll still keep getting the, the weekly emails, but you're leaving on Saturday. Well, then we'll stay in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Yeah, Molly, people are learning about her dad and his legacy.